Good morning. Thank you for joining us this Sunday morning at Colonial Hill Baptist Church. I'm Ernie Armstrong, and it's my privilege to lead in Bible study this morning from Colonial Hill. Today we continue our series of lessons from the Old Testament. Uh, as we announced uh, at the beginning of this quarter, we were going to study from four of the minor prophets. The minor prophets are called minor prophets because they are lesser in length, not because they are lesser in importance. Uh, those, the four that we're going to study, we've just finished last week uh, with the fourth lesson from the book of Amos. Today, we're going to look at the book of Jonah, and then we'll look at uh, Hosea, uh, and Micah. Uh, Jonah is probably the minor prophet we are most familiar with. And today's lesson, uh, because we're only going to spend two weeks on uh, Jonah, and maybe that's because so many of you are so uh, are already familiar with Jonah. Uh, we, as I say, we'll just spend a couple of weeks, and we'll be looking at chapters 1 and 2 in today's lesson. Um, the uh, uh, curriculum writers for our Sunday School lesson material entitled this lesson, No Escape. Um, but I ran across uh, a commentary that suggested a better title. Uh, and uh, that commentator says, do you remember Joe Lewis, the famous heavyweight boxer? Well, he was facing a challenger, Billy Kahn, in 1946. Kahn was 25 pounds lighter than Lewis, and he had faced Lewis before, so his strategy was going to be to dodge and run, and uh, not try to trade punches with the much uh, stronger, heavier Joe Lewis. Sports writers asked Lewis how he was planning to deal with Khan's strategy, and Lewis famously said, and thus becomes uh, what this commentator says would be the best uh, title for today's lesson, uh, Joe Lewis said, he can run, but he can't hide. And so he certainly was right. He knocked out uh, Billy Kahn in the eighth round, for those of you who are boxing fa fans. But it gives us a good title uh, to the book of Jonah. He can run, but he can't hide. Um, that's definitely true of our relationship with God as well. Um, and as I've mentioned, it, it tells us about uh, Jonah. Um, let's, uh, let's look at verse 1 of chapter 1 of Jonah. And it reads, and I'm reading from the New International Version, for those of you who read along with me. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai. Verse 2, go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it because its wickedness has come up before me. Is this the first mention in the Bible of Jonah? The answer is no. Jonah is mentioned in 2 Kings chapter 14, specifically verse 25. And uh, it, it talks about Jonah... Uh, well, let me put the context in. It talks about Jonah during the reign of Joash, the king of Israel, the king that is of the northern kingdom of Israel. And if you've been with us in our recent letter uh, lessons, you'll understand the difference between the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom called Judah. Uh, Joash was an evil king. But according to verse 25, he expanded the kingdom according to the, 
to the word of the Lord. And here's the important part for our lesson today. Which he spoke through his servant Jonah, the son of Amittai, the prophet, who was at Gath Hefer. <laughs> uh, a, a great name. First verse of jo the book of Jonah identifies us as this same Jonah. He, the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai. So the book of Jonah, or the setting for Jonah, is uh, in 800, the 800 B.C.s during the reign of Joash. Um, so where is this Gaff Hefer? Uh, that's a city. Uh, Joshua chapter 19 tells us that uh, Ga uh, Gath Hefer, the city, was on the boundary of the territory that set aside for the sons of uh, Zebulun, one of the tribes, one of the 12 tribes of Israel. And of course, there actually were 13 tribes, uh, but that's a different lesson. Uh, it's located in northern, uh, north central uh, Israel. Thus, Jonah was a prophet in the northern kingdom. He, his time of uh, service as a prophet would be shortly after Elisha, uh, the great prophet. This time, not. In, not uh, in 2 Kings uh, chapter 14, but in the book of Jonah, uh, God tells Jonah to go on a mission trip to Nineveh to preach to them. Now, Nineveh was an important city in Assyria. Now, you'll remember from our lessons the last four weeks uh, where Amos was prophesying um, Assyria is the empire that preceded the Babylonian Empire. They were a ruthless uh, empire known for their brutality. And uh, in 722 BC, sometime after Jonah, uh, they are the they're the empire that uh, defeated. Uh, overran the northern kingdom and carried its citizens off into captivity, never to be uh, seen again as one people group. And uh, verse 2 of uh, Jonah, God tells Jonah, Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it, because its wickedness has come up before me. Uh, but... Verse 3 says, But Jonah ran away from the presence of the Lord and headed for Tarshish. Uh, Tarshish. Uh, let's put a map up that uh, gives us some idea. On the right-hand side of your screen, and I'm going to pull it up on mine as well, um, you see the end, the eastern edge of the Mediterranean Sea, and there in the middle uh, is Joppa. Joppa is, in essence, a present-day uh, suburb, if you could say that. Uh, it's located just south of Tel Aviv, the capital of Israel. And Assyria is to the north and east of, uh, of Joppa. And on the map, on the far edge, far right edge of, of the map on the screen, you see Nineveh the great city of Assyria. Instead of going to Nineveh, when God told him to go there and preach against it, you can follow the red line west across the Mediterranean to uh, Tarshish, which is believed, uh, it's not really identified uh, in the Bible or in uh, historical writings, but it's believed to be where Spain is located. Uh, okay, we can... Uh, uh, set down the map now <clears throat> you get the picture and that's why we showed the map to give you a picture that when God said go to Nineveh uh,
Jonah went in the opposite direction, as far away in the known world as he could get. He was running from the presence of the Lord. Uh, we see several things here that uh, are important to our lesson and our study uh, from the book of Jonah. Um, notice how Jonah has fled from the presence of the Lord. Uh, that's a key statement, and so I mentioned it, it several times. Um, Jonah was running from the presence of God, um, and it's repeated, that, pr that phrase is repeated three times in chapter 1. Uh, there uh, in uh, verse 3, uh, after paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. The New International doesn't say from the presence of the Lord, but other translations do, and I think it illustrates it, uh, illustrates what Jonah is actually doing better to say from the presence of the Lord. Um, then in verse 10, it says, the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. Now, as I said, most of you know the general uh, theme of uh, Jonah, and so we're not going to read all the intervening verses uh, just because we're not going to have time. But uh, while on board the ship going west instead of going east by land to Nineveh, a storm uh, comes upon uh, uh, the, the ship. Verse 4, Then the Lord sent a great wind on the sea, and such a violent storm arose from the ship, threatening, uh, arose that the ship threatened to break up. So uh, everybody was uh, concerned. The sailors threw off all of the cargo to try to lighten the ship. I'm not a, a sailor or a ship person. I don't know how that was going to help them. Um, but in order to make the ship more navigatable, I suppose is, is the terminology, they threw off all the cargo. That did not, uh, did not help. They attempted to row to the coast uh, to land, to get away from the storm, but it was so severe they couldn't do so. Jonah, on the other hand, was asleep down below, and so the captain comes to him and says, everybody else is praying to their God. Why don't you pray to your God? Maybe your God will hear us. Uh, at this day and time, it's 800, uh, 800 B.C., uh, or thereabouts, the people, not the Jews, but the people of the world, believed that gods were territorial. Uh, so when you were in uh, Philistine, the Ph Philistia, uh, Dagon was the god who had power uh, in that ter territorial area. If you were in Sidon, uh, Asherah, would be the god or goddess uh, who had power over that region. But their thought was each god had his own geographical region. But we know, because we are believers in God Almighty and the word of God, that he is the one who made the heavens and the earth. So he was not some little geographical God, he is the Lord of heaven and earth. Therefore, uh, illustrating why you can't run and hide from God, from Yahweh. Um, if we took a moment to go over to Psalm 139 and look at verses 7 through 10, we would see where it says, Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence. If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, behold, you are there. 
if I take the wings of dawn, if I dwell on the remotest part of the sea, even there your hand will lead me and your right hand will lay hold of me. <clears throat> I don't know if uh, the author of Psalm 139 was thinking of Jonah, but it sure has an application there. Uh, and of course, this concept that God is everywhere uh, is both has both positive and some negative uh, at, uh, attributes. Obviously, it can be most comforting that God is always with us. One of the most comforting psalms is Psalm 23. I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Um, but on this, in the same vein, uh, it can be convicting because you cannot get away from God Almighty, Yahweh. You can run, but you can't hide. Um, what we really need to do is not to run from God, but instead to run to God. Uh, but sometimes, like Jonah, we have to learn the hard way. So what is some of the application of this aspect of the lesson? And there are quite a few applications in Jonah that may be why it is uh, most well-known by uh, many of us. There are many applications, uh, but this first one, God is everywhere. It, is no good, it does no good to try to run from God because you cannot hide. Um, and so we might ask, is there something God is calling you to do today? He called Jonah to go on a mission trip to Nineveh and preach against their evilness. But is there something God is calling you to do that you are reluctant to do? Uh, might, you, might God be asking you to teach a Sunday school class or to serve in some way, to witness to someone, maybe even to go on a mission trip like Jonah was asked to do? You can run, but you can't hide when God is calling you. Um, there are some other applications uh, through Jonah as well, and we see in these first two chapters. Um, one is the sovereignty of God, as we've already uh, referenced. God is on his throne. He is in charge of everything in the universe. And from our studies from Amos, uh, we looked at the stars uh, and the galaxies in heaven. And God produced, created uh, all that we see in the heavens. Um, he created this earth and all of the amazing aspects of this earth. Um, we read in just, just a moment ago in verse 4, Then the Lord sent a great wind on the sea. Um, some translations say he hurled a great wind on the sea. As we have been watching the newscasts of uh, Hurricane Ian, as it is and has devastated uh, the state of Florida uh, and uh, damage to other states, but certainly Florida got the brunt of it, <clears throat> I was reminded of some of our our, our lessons from Amos and we talked about uh, God would take the water out of the sea and put it on the land. We think of that as evaporating and then raining and pro producing and providing us with the rain and the water that we need. One of the uh, stories was uh, Tampa, Florida was one of the places that Hurricane Ian was first expected to make landfall and the devastation that they anticipated. But what they were observing was as the hurricane turned south of Tampa to cross Florida, 
the counterclockwise winds produced wind that literally blew the water out of Tampa Bay, out into the sea. Uh, and then it's, I, I think it is repositioned and uh, tremendous amounts, amounts of rain fell on Florida as a result. Uh, <clears throat> the great storm that Jonah <clears throat> and the sailors in the boat with in the ship with him encountered, it didn't just happen in this illustration. God caused it to happen. Uh, in verse 9, Jonah says, when he is asked who he who, uh, who he was, who are you? Uh, he had admitted that he believed that the storm came because he, Jonah, was fleeing from the presence of the Lord. And he says, uh, I am a Hebrew and I worship the Lord, the God of heaven who made the sea and the land. Uh, the next verse, verse 10, I think, illustrates uh, another great point. This terrified them. This would be the sailors. This terrified them, and they asked, What have you done? They already knew he was running away from the Lord because he had already told them so. Uh, Jonah says, God, and here he uses the word Lord, or it's written Lord, L, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. Whenever you see that uh, in the uh, Bible, it's not Adonai, it's not Lord with the little letters. It is the personal name of God himself, Y-H-W-H, -H, Yahweh, God himself. Uh, verse 17, uh, at the end of chapter 1, the last verse in chapter 1, and really where uh, our curriculum writers would have us start the lesson, verse 17 says, but the Lord provided a great fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was inside the fish three days and three nights. Whether there was a great fish swimming in that area of the Mediterranean Sea, or God created it right then for that purpose, God provided that fish. He is sovereign God. And then the last verse of chapter 2, Two, which is also part of our study today, verse 10 reads, And the Lord commanded the fish, and it vomited Jonah onto dry land. As Jonah said, we worship Yahweh, the creator of heaven and earth, the sea and the dry land. Uh, if we were to jump and we're not going to, uh, uh, other than to quote it, all the way over to chapter 4 of Jonah. It says, God appointed a plant to grow. God appointed a worm to attack the plant, and then God appointed or caused a an east wind to blow, all to provide a message and a teaching uh, to Jonah. God is sovereign over this. Now, just as uh, Pastor Reed talked about in his sermon last week, I do not believe God uh, is in heaven and he pulls every string, pushes every button, and causes every single thing to happen. I believe he created the world he created man and placed him in charge of the world. And some things he allows uh, to naturally occur based upon laws that uh, he created, uh, laws of nature, for instance. Um, but I also believe that if God desires to intervene, he can cause a great wind to blow against the ship. He can cause a great fish to swallow Jonah and then to cause him uh, to be vomited up on dry land. 
He is sovereign over all things. Uh, Ephesians 1.11 says he works all things after the counsel of his will. I think it is his will that causes the world to continue to go around. Uh, there are things that happen in this world that happen contrary to God's will. And I believe that it's sort of the basis of some of my belief that God doesn't cause those bad things. Uh, man is in charge of some cho or has the ability to provide some choice. Um, okay, Jonah believes in the sovereign God. He tells his fellow travelers to throw him overboard and it will calm the sea and they were afraid to do so. They were <clears throat> they didn't want to harm uh, an individual, but they had no other uh, plan. They followed Jonah's instructions, threw him over, overboard into the sea. The sea was calmed, and a great fish swallowed him up. Uh, another great application in the book of Jonah, maybe one of the best or the biggest, is uh, the application regarding repentance. Uh, we've talked about repentance and the importance of it before, uh, how general, how it often is neglected uh, as, an, as a concept in our church. Why, we just want God to forgive us and let us keep on doing what we're doing. Uh, okay, I, I sinned, uh, forgive me and let me keep on going. But God is not satisfied with that. He wants to forgive us but he wants us to genuinely repent from our sins, our running from the presence of God. How? He wants us to change our mind. I repent. I regret doing that. I'm sorry I did that. That's repentance. That's, I'm sorry, that's changing our mind. But he wants us to change our direction. Uh, uh, perhaps a good definition of repentance is a change of mind that leads to a change of direction. Uh, we might think of the prodigal son uh, who took his father's inheritance, uh, or took his inheritance from his father prematurely. He spent it all in wasteful, sinful living, and he came to his senses, says Luke chapter 15, and said, what am I doing? There, my father's house uh, even the servants are better off than me. Uh, I'm going to get up and go to my father. He had a change of mind, and now then he illustrated a change of direction. That's what Jonah is doing. We saw on the map he went west in rebellion against God, fled from the presence of God, but he couldn't hide. And he came to, his real, to the realization uh, inside the belly of the fish. I think he came to the realization there on the ship when he told the men to throw him overboard. Uh, chapter 2 uh, contains Jonah's prayer. And there is some question as to whether uh, Jonah, uh, whether this prayer is the prayer Jonah said while in the belly of the fish. Um, but I think... Verse uh, 2 illustrates it's the prayer that he gives and states, uh, our, our chapter 2 tells of the prayer that he was saying in the belly of the fish. Verse 2, in my distress I called to the Lord and he answered me. This is past tense. So this is written, at, obviously, after uh, he gets out of uh, the belly of the fish. Um, so we see Jonah here as another example of repentance. We would go a little bit further to chapter 3, and God again tells Jonah to go to Nineveh. He has changed his mind about running from the presence of God, but now he changes his direction and goes in the direction that God has for him, and he goes to Nineveh. Uh, a couple of other things real quickly. Uh, 
Jonah does not say that the book of Jonah does not say he was swallowed by a whale, says a great fish. <coughs> Last year, there was a news story, uh, just, of, just for interest, of a man in Massachusetts who was actually swallowed by a whale. He did not get into the belly of the fish, according to the news articles. Um, but he got the fish, the whale, to uh, spit him out. Uh, rare, unusual. But if God says uh, something is to occur, it can occur. A last principle, and a principle uh, or application uh, that maybe is the most important uh, Jonah's three days and three nights in the whale, it, or the fish, the great fish, is used by Jesus as an illustration of the sign. The, uh, the religious leaders were asking Jesus for a sign of who he was. And he said, I'll not give you sign a sign except one. As Jonah was in the belly of the fish, the great or huge fish, for three days and three nights, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Uh, creates a little bit of a problem, three nights and versus three days. On the third day, Jesus rose from the grave. Uh, but that's, an, a, again, another matter. The illustration is that as Jonah was three days in the fish, so Jesus was buried for three days in the earth. Jonah was as good as dead, but God uh, literally, 